Hi, this is Siddharth Aluwalia. Welcome to the 100x Entrepreneur Podcast Series. I have today with me Karthik Reddy, founder and managing partner Bloom Ventures. Bloom Ventures is known to be one of the earliest early stage funds in India. Welcome Karthik to the podcast. Thanks a lot Siddharth. Uh, lovely to have this opportunity. I'm uh, glad we finally meet and uh, looking forward to chatting with you. Karthik, we would love to know more about your journey. So, um I should start from my first uh, journey to the US, 1999. Uh land of a business school, think I want to be on Wall Street and then get seduced by the fact that technology is shaping uh most of America and it was the peak of uh, the dot com boom and uh within a year it was dot com bust and uh but I spent a lot of time uh on the west coast. so my summer internship silicon valley treks and uh felt like this was my calling i mean just to see how rapidly technology can transform business models was very exciting and uh of course there were various monikers much later software as were eating the world and mark andreessen's war cries that you know tech is going to change every industry but uh, uh i kind of fell in love with that idea much before it became a war cry but struggled to break into that industry so i was briefly in technology banking in the valley uh, spent for 5 years came back to india thought i should get into vc but nobody seemed interested in my profile back then and then thanks to the times group sort of fell in, you know uh, into back into the angel investing scene i was representing them in the angel groups and uh, got connected back into the ecosystem and then just saw that there was a huge gap between the large series a funds which were all above 100 million and the angels and so we said that there's a huge gap here it can't be that every company miraculously takes a few angel checks and becomes a you know successful series a pitch so it looks like there's a role for a class of funds and that was our bloom was born and uh, and that's how the journey began in 2010 how did you and sanjay meet and when did you both decided to partner to start bloom so sanjay and me uh, it's definitely thanks to mumbai angels so though we are contemporaries both uh, engineers from the mid 90s basically we didn't get to meet until mumbai angels we found ourselves on a few common cap tables and then uh, we were kind of introduced by folks saying hey you both are thinking about doing something in early stage maybe you should talk and that's how the dating began and it probably took 9 uh, months of that uh various vetting by you know my potentially one of a family office that was going to anchor him his dad and brother and their family office and uh that journey led to finally us saying yes in middle of 2010 and so uh and then we never never looked back uh so very complementary skills very complementary networks very complementary people and uh, so i think that's what that's what's made it work so you are known as the hard guy in bloom and sanjay is known as the soft guy why is that no well, i think uh, no it's, it's, that's why i said personalities i think you um, we 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 are very different personalities i'm a very cut and dry when it uh, comes to uh, uh, i guess dealing with uh, decision frameworks how i uh, make decisions uh, and sanjay is a, a consensus builder he's a people enabler and so he wants everybody in the room to be pleased and i wish life was like that it won't uh, work if all of us were in the firm behave that way so i think uh, ashish also brings in you know more of that as a third partner but now we've evolved where you know ashish and me i think bring in that uh, strain to the firm and sanjay continues to sort of help us build an ecosystem and uh, that kind of the brand that needs to have the soft edges when it comes to dealing with the ecosystem that said i think most founders will say it's not about me or ashish or sanjay or any of our team members i think what we're proud of what we've built at bloom is that every team member uh brings that right blend of soft and hard when it comes to entrepreneurs and that's what matters the most uh and uh we we know where to mix it up is what i feel right so we i think collectively i would argue that even i i or my team members were soft uh, not just sanjay on uh, the founders in the first iteration and we realized unfortunately that doesn't build great businesses <laughs> so you got to be hard on yourselves and as well as founders when uh, things are not going to plan and we'll learn to become more sort of balanced on that front so how uh, were you able to build the first team at bloom who were the first three team members and how did you find them i think the minute uh, we got uh, 
uh, you know people to uh, listening to our pitches a lot more people got to know so everything from pipeline to team members everything was referrals lps everything was referral based right so you would pretty much have to you're literally selling the vision and you're hoping that believers jump in at as any stakeholder the guys who took money from us also had to believe in us right uh we the first guys who took money from us took money when we had like you know a first close of like 20 crores and 100 crore fund what if we didn't raise the rest what if we didn't give follow up money so everybody believes in what vision and pitch you're making to them as well um so quite naturally it's people who are connected to us in some form and uh now that you asked that question and i think about it uh two of the first three were through mumbai angel net as a network adit used to volunteer there uh, adit parik uh, he had worked in avishkar but he had gotten out and was working with his uncle who was an entrepreneur in logistics and doing this on the side and so when he heard that we were starting he was very keen to be a part of the early team so he was the first guy then ashish was my like wingman even in the times group which was my last day job so there was again this familiarity that i love for me to bring on ashish and like most i don't know if you've heard this before but m- most founders will bring in uh, uh, you know first degree familiarity into their early teams and that's what happened at bloom as well and sajid interestingly was an angel investor uh, he'd exited a software services beha- uh, business in uh, uh, of his own and we met as potential co-investors evaluating a deal uh, ironically we never did the deal <laughs> but he kept at it and uh, figured out hey you guys are building a team this is kind of what i want to do uh, you think this will work for me full time and he kind of came on so every year from 2011 to 15 we added one such person uh, and since arpit's well known as an early team member he was the next one and arpit similarly came through some tweet i wrote and different people referred in arpit and six months of conversations later he was a team member so no hire pre 2018 was made without six to nine months of familiarity there was never a jd there was never a interview per se but it was like multiple a series of interviews series of meetings and i think we could have put a better framework but in retrospect no regrets but basically we got the culture right as a result we were never in a hurry to hire uh, and that's what kind of created a sort of even tone you know culture in in bloom which we were able to sustain through uh, the first 7 10 people across the first 7 8 years so bloom is known to be the most founder friendly vc in the ecosystem guys you back up they vouch for you why is that how, how does this culture happen i think partly it comes from you know this um, who we are all as people i think it's not a it's not a behavior you can force fit you know uh, and so it's just who we are and the kind of people we ended up picking as the first additions to the team i think we all believe that uh, bizarrely all of us have had either um a, a failed or suboptimal entrepreneurial journey all of us actually uh, interestingly uh, at least the first six people who came in uh, and it points to you know you knowing the hardships of what it takes to do the really early stage of an entrepreneurial journey and the rest i think we've grown on the backs of our best entrepreneurs but that those early lessons we've never forgotten right and so we know that you know founders go through a lot and the ability to empathize with them and see how else we can help has been kind of a foundation for bloom and everything that we built the platform services we built around the fact that we value add uh, not just as a one on one in a strategy session but we bring financial services hiring uh, banking fundraising and that comes from that mindset the founder needs help let's try and figure out how we can help and uh, when you do it repeatedly and then you platformize it and you make it systematic then it becomes synonymous with your brand and i don't think at at least our scale uh, anybody can uh, claim that they've done it bigger and better than us right at our scale um, which is uh, pre series a hardly any fees but this large portfolio but very very few founders maybe 10% are not happy with us but everybody else would say hey these guys went and did more than anybody else could have in their place and that's what we're proud of what's your purpose in life and what's the purpose of bloom i think it's um when we started i felt it was more because we loved the idea that we can work with uh founders on the ideation stage of a business and we were naive enough to think that that excitement will carry us through 
to be very honest. Uh, so, but it has limitations. You can't build a team, you can't build an institution with $20 million funds, $30 million funds. It's tough. It's a lifestyle business as we tell other people who come and pitch to us. You can make it a lifestyle business, but you can't institutionalize that behavior. And so we, we've been constantly asking ourselves that. And I mean, I know, you know, it'll, it'll sound kind of, you know, uh, like any other VC's pitch. I think we've come to realize that, you know, it, it's not very different from any other world-class VC, right? I'm not going to be unique on that front because I have to be motivated enough to come to work every day and drive myself and drive my team uh, to go out of their way to help these young founders. So clearly it's around young, early businesses. So we want to sort of partner and nurture you know, really passionate entrepreneurs who are trying to solve really hard problems. I think that's been the shift. We don't want simple, you know, gimmicky, tweaky problems, right? We want people who really want to solve really hard problems, really transformative in nature, right? Fundamentally change how, you know, local transportation works or, you know, financial services is shifted for someone or how you build a new asset classes like a small case. Uh, so thinking very, very you know, blue sky and want to make whatever they do, even if you're building a B2B business, which relies heavily on technology, but is serving the globe, we're basically putting India on the map. We are somehow uplifting India because we keep asking ourselves, why aren't we doing the hot deal which comes across the ocean from Singapore or Israel or people get referenced all the time. We're saying, well, that's not us. We're not here to, you know, fundamentally just deploy capital for the sake of. We need every dollar. We don't have gazillion dollars. We have very limited dollars. We want every one of those to be very impactful in the way India is shaped as like, a, you know, reaches its potential over the next decade or two. Because that's your peak, peak prime time that you have as a team and as a, as a firm. And so uh, I think that's, that's our sense of purpose, right? Uh, fundamentally work alongside these entrepreneurs at very early stages so that you feel like you're a part of something transformate. And how you see the vision for Bloom evolve in the next five to 10 years? So I think we, um, we see that um, we have to grow to what the customer wants you to become, like any good business, right? You can't say, no, I'll just be this, you know, cute guy cutting one crore checks. That's what we used to do and uh, not move to where your customer wants you to. So I think we've been listening to our entrepreneurs. I don't think we're driven by the fact, of course, it's driven by the fact that we want to build a bigger team. We want finally a nicer office. We want to be able to, you know, get world-class institutional investors. That doesn't happen if you're 20, 30, 40, 50 million. So in a nutshell, we've been telling ourselves, hey, what drives A, our partner vision? And how do we translate that to our next level of leadership and the to be, you know, uh, lifetime, you know, team members who will hopefully someday become partners. And then what kind of culture do we build to bring in more such people? So I want to be able to attract that passion and that talent as a team because that's the fun of working together. Of course, you can check out and just work with your founders, but that then you could have done that as an angel investor. Why bother doing it as an institution? So the passion is to build a world-class or rather best-in-class institutional investor in this at this scale. So that's why I say best-in-class, not making tall claims that every asset asset class and size will have winners and a great firm. We want to be best in our class, number one. I think the ambition is very simply to, you know, uh, dumb it down. We don't want to be shooting for less than 5x funds. Because in India, things take time. So I have to adjust for a time factor that things will take two years more. So that hits your IRR. We're measured by IRR. And so don't want to take an uh, easy way out and say 3x chalega. It won't work. I think we have to shoot for 5x funds. We are raising a third fund of 100 million. Uh, 80 was a target. We might hopefully shoot and get, shoot over that and get to close at 100. By the fifth fund, which is maybe five years away, uh, and that's how far we've thought. Uh, so I don't know about 10 years, but five years is what we've thought. I want to be able to have 500 million under management. And that's when, in, that's 2024, right? And so think about 2025 and think about it at 2010, we were zero and we started with 100 crore rupees. And so that I think is a big enough leap, leap for me as an entrepreneur, as with my partners to see that rise in bloom. So we've never stated that figure outside. You're the first to hear it. But that's the internal ambition and vision. And what have been the challenges from the first raising the first fund, deploying it, getting the money back to the LPs from the first and second fund? 
So I think one realization is that cycles are very long in this business, and that's not uh, India's uh, uh, specific. That's not a Bloom specific problem. It's uh, a an India specific problem, and it's anyway a venture capital problem. So it's not like we are way off targets because we have to benchmark ourselves. When we go overseas, by the way, you take a flight and get out of this country. They say, why the hell should I invest in India? Leave alone you. I have I can invest in China or I can invest in the U.S. So you're benchmarked overnight with global investors. Right? So it's not even your peers in India. You're suddenly somebody saying, I'd rather just not play a fund like you and I can invest in some Chinese fund. So the benchmark, we're not way off benchmarks, by the way. So we are eight years into our first fund, only three and a half years into our second fund, right? We're closing in on four years later this year. And our f- first fund is marked up above 3x. We've returned half the fund. And that's not totally off whack. They just want to know, like if somebody says, oh, I think you're going to be a great fund benchmark to global funds, they want to know that you can hit a 5x. That's all they're asking. They're not expecting more given that India was a tough market, right? It's not been easy to see exits per se. My disappointment would be that we haven't yet built, we have we didn't build fast enough. So our first fund companies are still predominantly subscale. I don't have a single company other than Taxi for sure and now Grey Orange, which have crossed 100 million in valuation. We still think three or four can from the first fund, if not five, six. And uh, so those four years made it very slow, the first 2011 to 14. And 14, 15, we have a bunch of them, like Cashify, Belong. Things started picking up. The entire market shape shifted. More big, you know, more Series B money, more cross-border money, more Chinese money, uh, more co-investors, more peer investors. So when you take all of that cumulative effect into, into play, you suddenly see that uh, you know, the market has moved finally in the direction you expected it to move. So I, I think if we can accelerate what we did in fund two, fund one, by even two years and achieve the same milestones, we'll be in good shape. Eventually, the, when you say 4x, 5x, it better be in cash. Who cares about what it is on paper? So that's the ambition. Can we shoot for that? In the first fund, it might take 12 years. Hopefully, in the second fund, it takes 10 years and we deliver that. So that's, that's the internal goal set. India has been a poor market, as you said, for exits. Do you see this improving in 2019 to 2022 period? I think the the fact that founders who pass like a three, four, five year hurdle and don't die, survive, right? First rule. When they survive, hopefully they've created enough value that somebody will come and buy that business. Uh, not easy to find buyers. And not easy to get premiums on those kind of businesses. Um, and... Uh, the good, the good news from an exit's perspective is people have been building away for 10, 12, 14 years today, right? The first wave of venture money came in in five, six. So there are some lot of credible businesses out there. I don't know how many will sell, how many, will, how many buyers are active. We don't have too many Indian buyers. So exits don't happen unless you have an active M&A ecosystem, especially for venture. Or you hit a certain scale where you can have a very attractive IPO. Even that hasn't happened fast enough. I don't know whether it will dramatically change in the next 18 months, but I hope to hell it does change after that. I think it's very important to build a culture of companies that can go IPO and everything else should be seen as incidental. You can't build it the other way around. Saying, hey, who can I sell this to? Who will I get stock to? Which unicorn can I palm this off to? It's just a bad strategy in my view. You bloody well build to a proper IPOable business or don't bother is my take. Even the U.S. market is saying that and they've been doing it for 60 years. There's no hacks to that, right? Eventually, if you want a great cash exit, that's how it will happen is my take, right? I don't think as yet a Cisco or a Microsoft or a, you know, Salesforce is coming to India and buying a business for $3 billion. And in consumer, no way in hell are people coming and buying because they know the unit economics in India are going to be tough as a consumer business. You know, the Unilever's, PNGs of... The cokes of the world have been here for, you know, decades together. And they know it's a tough margin structure business, right? So yes, Walmart paid a premium. I don't know whether you can count on many, many more of those. So therefore, let's build IPOable business. And yes, it might feel like a little slower to build to profitability. But I mean, enough companies have shown that post IPO, they get, if you're delivering on profit and growth, you get re- rewarded very richly in the markets. Look at Nokri, look at Team Lease, right? Uh, these are companies which grew 30, 40, 50% after IPO and the stock's just like done incredibly well. 
So I think that's the path I would recommend, and I'm trying to push more and more of my companies that way. As an early stage venture capitalist, which markets have been a win for you in the last five years, where you had a predefined thesis? So we become entirely thesis driven in terms of how we approach our pipeline. Otherwise, to get fifty, sixty deals a week, which is what we get, you'll go mad reacting to pipeline. So, firstly, everything you can you can assume in the last maybe not as much, not as well thought out in the first uh, you know uh, maybe four years, uh, maybe a little bit more impulsive. But post that, post two thousand fifteen, I would argue that almost every bet we made has been thesis driven. So we broadly take an area. let's say education uh, since you asked healthcare we did about four or five last in the last 3 4 years um or a b2b is very broad i know but basically uh, anything which has really cutting edge software technology uh things like squad and locus and belong and all of these were done in the last 3 4 years and we're saying that's the edge can we build global businesses with indian edge in engineering uh as a thesis area in education we're saying how the hell does this country get out of its cycle of accelerated growth if we don't educate our people fast enough it's not going to happen by building schools everywhere it's going to happen digitally same with healthcare you're not going to build hospitals that 90% of this country can afford and there's got to be a de- different hospital delivery and financial services so actually ironically in the india side i would argue that our thesis areas and bets that have worked more are typically what are considered more impact oriented <laughs> education healthcare financial services and globally it's we've always had a leaning to b2b knowing that that's our forte can you take great engineering skills and package that into a global product play we've not i can't claim we've built unicorns yet i mean the good news is there are a few outside of our portfolio which are getting built i think we want to follow suit right and gray orange is much earlier but we continued with that stream and we allocate almost a third of our capital to that bucket and that's where the locuses and the belongs etc have come from which markets where you had a thesis didn't work out for you i think where thesis areas were either weak or where we were acting on the impulse of uh, a little bit more emotion and a little less objectivity or getting market sizing wrong is where we have failed a bit um gaming would be an example right first fund three bets nothing has scaled or worked um i don't think in the indian market was ready that's what all the series a vcs said never bet on any of them so it became self fulfilling um all these guys struggled uh, two of them are still alive but barely they make they break even but they're all million dollarish businesses um the other thing i would argue where we failed quite a bit was trying to do vertical product commerce got into the cycle too late that entire commerce engine works as a herd mentality either everybody is making bets or nobody is making bets and then you would bet on something like sports or school supplies or purple is the only one who survived and i think is they built incredibly frugally from that generation but otherwise all our bets died right and so there it's very tricky because the business scales runs out of money if you can't get the next round you're screwed and we didn't uh, anticipate how critical that will become we just as i think there was a lot of assumptions that hey you show a certain set of metrics and series a comes i think in the first cycle we were as naive as the founders and realized that it's such a thin market all it takes is for six or seven people to say no or even worse half of them to be invested in something which is vaguely competitive and you can't get a lot of things funded so the more common themes that get picked are dangerous in some sense for a small player like us because then you are always under headwinds because there's a bigger guy who says you know i've already made a bet in the space or adjacent space i won't fund anything of this nature so for us uh, not that they didn't work out because the founders weren't good but we began to appreciate that you have to know your capital market that you're selling into you can't be oblivious of it because you at our stage most of our peer funds you're all dependent on the larger funds to give at least enough growth capital of course one can argue that theoretically you can bootstrap or break even it's not trivial right and uh, we have to be conscious of that so wherever there was capital heavy capital required we've suffered a bit i remember like you pitching in very heavily for dunzo at a point in time when they were underfunded yeah because i think this is what i i my pet peeve in india has been that uh, india i think is an opportunity domestically to actually take uh, 
to find an indianized solution for our set of problems because you got to solve it at indianish price points that includes our consumption capacity uh, we don't have crazy disposable incomes right and uh, when you see a certain behavior uptick then you have to know that something in the product is working you have changed certain behavior and in the west i can't speak about china i don't know enough about china in the us if you get a whiff of that people line up outside your door to fund in india it's almost the opposite they say where's the comp i haven't seen anything like this work elsewhere how can this become a great market how is this sizable i have 15 million users who are sticky right i have x million uh, you know monthly transactions what are you talking about but no they want a comp and so i think it was that frustration to say that how can you take the stickiest hyperlocal behavior right outside of milk basket which is also a rather morning milk delivery and say that it doesn't have enough value to be back if that was missing you would never see a twitter or a google or a a, a, a facebook ever emerge or an uber right and it's because of new behavior creation that incredibly long large long term value gets created in the world and india is almost the antithesis of it all the large term value we're trying to create is in me too right by pumping more money and trying to win market share and win you know pole position on that what about other stuff and why can't it be built more frugally more thoughtfully more long term still haven't seen examples i would love to say that we build a few but only time will tell do you see this herd mentality sorry to say of vcs especially at the later stage going away in, in the coming time it's not easy i think it's a probability game right uh, it takes one person i keep telling founders are super frustrated right they'll come to us and say man i've just finished like my i'm looking at my excel sheet and i've pitched to 80 people how can nobody get this right what they don't realize is whether it's them or whether it's somebody who's raised money or i'm sure at some point uh, you know dipinder or uh, swiggy or oyo or everybody would have gone through this would have you feel like hey just because you got to where you are at every round there was a pe- bunch of people outside the door waiting to give you a check no it's usually just one person right it's a question of whether that one emerged out of 15 20 or emerged out of 80 to 100 and the reality seems to be the tougher the proposition the more people you have to meet to make that probability work so i don't think the herd mentality is going away right because effectively it's led by how you think the next check writer is going to think right and which automatically means by then the herd mentality is forming right if you're not ahead of the curve that means it's you're already a part of the herd and that's the irony of our business so uh, but that said i think it'll resonate if there if there are deep thinking thesis investors and you don't need every one of them to be ev- that in every sector you need a few like that in every segment but you have to somehow probabilistically go meet all of them and then your odds improve but it's an odds game yeah it I, and it's much tougher in a market like india where we haven't proven anything can turn cash flow positive can go ipo so the doubts will keep lingering even in the best of your companies so it's so difficult uh, to to know uh, who that one person in the literally in the world yeah because you know if when lee used to cut them from tiger is literally the only person in the world if you think about it you can say no no if lee didn't somebody else would have i say bullshit <laughs> i say basically if lee didn't it wouldn't have happened so many companies wouldn't happen if lee wasn't there yeah so you have to give him, like like i have given him credit publicly on it but i'm just saying similarly there are people tucked away it's just that you know it's such an early ecosystem it's not like everybody is easy to find or you hit the right person so you just have to maximize that probability we continue to try and do that at dunzo and hopefully we'll get to the next round and the next round but it's it's you're up against a wall so since you started the conversation with danzo we hope that we can prove everyone wrong indian vcs and you know talking about bloom also you have preferred founders who are magnanimous storytellers no a- i w- i wish it was true i i don't in fact i would argue that the guys who haven't uh, uh, played to played the stories out to potential in my portfolio are guys who don't do a good job of it so i agree with you i agree with the thesis i hope i i only back that no i don't think it's i don't think it's absolutely necessary especially because we have a good blend of b2b but i think to say that you can actually build a very large business 
without a capacity to story tell is fooling yourself it has nothing to do with vcs how do you sell how do you sell to your customers how do you sell to your employees how do you get your 400th employee to be as motivated or kicked about what you're building without being a great storyteller and i feel that's the essence of a great startup is ability to transmit the story because their their mission vision purpose has got to resonate with even the last person you hire this you know as of this morning right and that happens only if you're a great storyteller i don't think if you just do a blase hey here's your job go do it you can build a great startup so i'm convinced that it's the right skill to have i don't expect five people in the team to have it one or two is good enough but um it doesn't necessarily by the way people who sell a great story to a customer are not necessarily the ones who do it as well to investors for example but you need to have the skill in one way or the other is my take uh you just need an immense and think about it right i mean venture capital funds things broadly speaking that don't exist in that market broadly speaking which means how the hell are you selling people doesn't matter i think you're by, by bracketing it as a uh, storytelling to vc uh, you know you're doing it too narrowly you you know it's not about that it's about how do i get as i said uh, in my third year as i'm struggling towards uh, raising a series b how do i get like a great cto to join me it's not easy you got to sell them a story and i'm actually it's interesting because it's an example from this afternoon i have to interview a cto candidate for a pre series b company all over the weekend and i'm a i'm part of the storytelling i'm selling that guy a story for one of my companies you have to you have to make people believe in the cause of whatever that company is building towards as much as you believe it and it's the only way to propagate a great organization and eventually therefore get a great outcome is my take so how do you think companies like google facebook instagram whatsapp can be built in india where the founders are deeply technical and can visualize scale but not so good at storytelling very tough very tough i think i mean i i haven't met some of these guys i mean uh, like share chat for example obviously he's done a good job and i think uh, the passion comes through i think more and more uh, vcs if you look at uh, what um, i mean we call them outliers we call them mavericks we call them uh, uh, i think uh, orias coin misfits so i think you're beginning to recognize that you got to be able to not uh, straight jacket these into a formula that a founder has to be this way but almost learn to spot the uh, you know the exceptions right if you're going by a rule book then everybody can spot them right and so it goes back to how you build a founder detection framework in some sense and whether the founder and uh, for me at least uh, the the yardstick is um do i the founder and i if i'm the investor or in my team member relate and deal with the problem in their head as passionately as one another and it's it's very true that vcs find the founders they like and the founders like the vcs they like so true 7 out of 10 times wherever there misfits is not a happy marriage but you know otherwise it's true and so therefore i feel you know your your ability to uh, somehow weed them out from 2000 people to how many ever checks you're doing in a year is basically the skill and gut you have to develop which is why it's still a it's it's a it's a it's not a science and it's an art of the gut um and uh, and i think uh these kind of stories where uh it feels like a absolute virgin market where you have no idea whether this thing will work in india but becomes the next billion dollar story which is very unique to india is waiting to happen it's waiting to happen right uh whether that's relia 3 in our portfolio or whether that's something else uh we're doing some exotic stuff in agri right now i don't think there'll be global easy global parallels um we've made the bet obviously that's why we are happy that we picked something which we think is an edge case now we have to convince the next round person and the next round person but i feel more and more confident than 8 years ago where i feel more people in the ecosystem sense this that india's time is coming and you know we should back this crazy visions or visionary founders and some of them will play out those risky bets are the ones which are going to make the most money like my lps tell me historically you were shying away from that 
is it's probably true it was basically you didn't know what's going to work what's going to take off so you're hedging you're making more bets now you're saying no it's time to take more risk and if we are doing that i'm sure every other vc firm is thinking in the same way there's no point taking averaged out risk anymore uh, of of what exists in another market or what is a copycat or what is you know you got to pick up edge cases is my take which markets in 2019 2020 if you find a great team you would invest on the first meeting yeah we have changed our stripes from that first meeting investor <laughs> a lot we've never been that the impression might have been that because we cut a lot of checks uh you won't believe it even in the first fund where we have 70 plus checks i don't think we cut a check in more than 10 in less than 6 months we slow we just actually painfully slow uh which explains why we did 70 because we always used to get it in the end because either we didn't have money or we were taking too much time and it's become a more well thought out dna today so just to correct that perception i, I wish it was first I, i'll change that uh, slightly i'll i'll nuance it it's the first meeting is when you're right when the thesis founder philosophy problem instinctively hit you light bulb goes off and then for 3 4 months you're testing whether that light bulb was a fake signal right you're saying did i get too seduced by the founder what does the rest of his team look like did i get too seduced by the space this is not going to become very large is the customers actually going to pay for it is there a revenue model in this these historically in fund one would have been hey we're taking a 100k punt let's do it right now i'm testing that out more than i ever did before or face forcing the team to when i say i I hardly do most of this investing it's more the team but uh, that's how we are training ourselves specific to spaces uh, we think anything that touches this uh, you know uh, the 100 to 500 million category of you know mobile user is very very interesting so anything that empowers that user is fascinating to us so we do a whole bunch of stuff uh, in uh, our work in financial services and agri as of late uh, out of the first 10 investments in fund 3 3 will be agri uh, at least one will be uh, actually out of those 3 one or two are fintech oriented uh, so there's a lot of that flavor and uh, surprisingly another 3 or 4 will be really deep tech and i don't think we are done i think we'll probably do two three more because you asked about the next year year and a half and that's been the flavor for fund 3 we're just saying go where the deepest conviction is and just double down on that space don't hedge don't do commerce because it's flavor of the day and you don't have a you know a, a deep connect with what's getting built out there if it's truly differentiated great but that's the perils of being a small fund if it's not truly differentiated if isn't there there isn't a great enough moat what's the purpose of your million dollars it's too small in the current day and age to make any difference so you got to be able to back founders who are just building something towards the edge that becomes mainstream tomorrow that's our biggest challenge today so b2b doesn't remain a core bet for you it does so when i say deep tech it's predominantly b2b i don't see us selling you know necessarily something genomic or uh, you know software which is deep uh, anything in software ai robotics which becomes consumer oriented so that's b2b it's just that even in b2b i'm a little tired of playing marketing automation or like you know vertical software sales efficiency i'm like where is our edge right uh, we're competing with global players there are going to be 16 such guys in the us it's tough so we navigating some of that early stage founder risk to occur which we started with a couple of us funds but when it comes to India centric what deserves a million dollars i'm saying show me what what's going on and uh, how somebody's truly tapping artificial intelligence to build better customer centric uh, customer service centric applications that's one of our bets or how's uh, you know how are we doing uh, truly indigenous uh, three wheeler electric vehicle small cargo that's as narrow as that right and we're saying we'll double down on that kind of risk and that kind of a founder rather than simply pick something generic out there and what has the b2b played out as a story for you like we know fresh works in india but are there 10 or such more companies in the pipeline i think they're coming i think they're coming i'm convinced that we'll build so the rule of thumb just as uh, for your listeners in my book is uh, if you can build a 75 to 125 million dollar arr company 
you can be a billion dollar business you can, if, if you built it with healthy margins which in most software oriented stuff you can build in hardware in deep science it's much tougher we have like a carbon capture company it's not easy to equate in that same fashion because there's far more value in the ip than necessarily in the revenue right uh, so different yardsticks for software and everything which is non software but uh, to believe that you can build a 75 100 million dollar business sitting out of india for the globe is becoming far easier to digest i mean we we have uh, metal past the 10 million dollar mark exotel is past the 10 million dollar mark if you ask me 3 4 years ago i would have said yeah they're all at 3 4 5 million now to see double digit million is becoming and there's my punch line right if you know how to get a company past the 10 million dollar mark unless you're doing something wrong uh you fundamentally should be well primed to hit a reorg button a rethink button and just hit a accelerator to 10x from there the challenge was to get a business of those, that nature which is global in nature from 0 to 1 1 to 5 5 to 10 if you finish those three phases i think you can put all the engines together to drive it from 10 to 100 and that's what you're seeing when tiger is playing or a falcon edge is playing or other guys are playing b2b i think that's what they're beginning to realize hard work's all been done is now it's about hitting that button and so let's zoom right and so i'm just saying there are a whole bunch of companies bunched up there right a lot even in a tiny portfolio if they've grown to 10 there are a lot more there which are 20 30 40 and so then it's just about growing 3x to 5x from there and you have billion dollar companies i think i think we'll have a dozen of them by 2025 uh, as part of the bloom dna we would like to know when you backed gray orange There was no taker for that market in India. So India me robotics kahan dikhta hai? Who takes robotics in India? India. Yeah, yeah. Fund one. I mean, we're not going to take more credit than we deserve, right? It was about the diversity of our portfolio allowed us to carve out uh, because we did seventy bets, seven, eight, or nine bets were deep tech, and I could get away by the valuations were so cheap. Uh, I don't know which era you've been tracking the market from, but. If you look at 2011, 12, 13, our portfolio, 90% of our investments were made between a million and a half and three post. 90% of our investments, right? Nothing outside that range. That was where the market was. Nobody was giving paisa. No one was giving crazy valuations. And so, as a result, we with 200k, we got a lot of the company, and we got to take this risk. And you got that leverage, rest of it from a bunch of angels, right? The bits angels and a few other people. So if you didn't make those bets with that leverage and those odds, when will you make it, right? So partly it's structural. The market allowed us to take a lot more risks. That said, we've played grey orange in every round since, all the way to the last round, close to half a billion dollars. That shows that we are evolving and saying we have conviction now. I don't care whether the rest of the Indian market thinks it's worth it or not. Thank God, you know, the Flipkart guys referred them to Tiger. Tiger came in. Rest hopefully will be history, right? From there, we never looked back. So I think the failure of the Indian ecosystem is not to recognize or have that confidence in our own founders to go global. Today, more than half the revenue comes from the U.S. So if you ask me back then, did you know this for sure? I knew the founders' vision for sure. I mean, they are remarkably one of those founders who, from year two, if not year one, have been saying, uh, "I think this is an IPOable business. We'll build till IPO, and we'll build beyond. We'll have a campus someday in Gurgaon." Who talks like that in a second year of your business? That's what's allowed us to back five checks into that company through five rounds, right? So I think it boils down to conviction or your ability to look the founders in the eyes. These guys are crazy. This is going to be at it, right? And therefore, you back this. What else is there to back, right? And they've proven us or right and proven everybody else wrong. And today, the you know the three biggest deals last year, you know, are all double-digit million dollars. and selling globally so i think uh, we we took a bet that they are crazy enough to believe that they can win the space there's a huge vacancy in the space after amazon bought kiva so it's a punt worth taking that's what i'm saying deep enough risk otherwise is not enough return no no risk no return right and and so we paid uh, we played fairly hedged bet if you ask me <laughs> like a, a crore out of two odd crores and it's come a long way I think that bet is playing out very well because Tiger has now a focus on, as you said, B two B with ten million dollar, yeah. twenty million dollar yeah. checks, and yeah. that you focused on two thousand eleven, two thousand twelve. Way too early, if you ask me. 
and and it tires out people right like so i would say a metal born in 4 years later would have been same size and screaming to 5x from here but born 4 years earlier gets tiring as a journey because nobody believed nobody gave the money no one thought they'll go global it's very tiring boss on an investment process at which stage should the founder reach out to blue so uh that's a tough one uh we become a little lazy in cutting the early checks um unless we know the founder the founder is incredible prior creds right if it's a brand new founder it's very tough that said uh, if it's a high quality refro if it's a space we already love it's never too early never too early so uh, we have the first checks probably in in a company which will get announced in a month or two uh where the founder is only bootstrapped so far and he's never done a startup before right and that to us is fairly early for a fund 3 check where we're cutting closer to 750k to a million dollars um but um it's never early because we love the problem set that he's solving for and so if you get an intro into us you should definitely pitch whenever whenever you think you've quit your job and you're ready to pitch right and uh, at worst what's going to happen we're going to say hey we really like this space we might not do the first round but the good news now is blooms become big enough that we can skip the first round and come in in the second round unless something goes crazy in the company and somebody's putting in 10 million dollar round then we can't play but all the way up to 3 4 million dollars i can play today and so that's the change bloom so i'm not that worried about missing any particular company as long as the founder and us know that we really liked each other and we can work together uh, down the line so that's the new shift was there any uh, year in the blooms journey where you were playing fomo on missing out deals let's say 2015 2014 no i don't think it was fomo as much as i think we we tend to get eager in cycles so i think we were so slow in 14 15 that we didn't have money for almost a uh, year and a half too we used to be at a believe it or not uh, 18 20 companies a year pace and we slowed screeched to five companies a year <laughs> over a year and a half so we're like itching to do stuff so the pipeline gets built up everything gets lined up and then boom out of the gate your 20 companies old already in front too within a year uh something like that right so we ended up doing 15 a year in in uh, in uh, fund 2 uh, as well uh so it slowed but it didn't slow as much and now we're slowing it far more but uh i don't think it's ever been about fomo because our approach back then was far more flexible now it's setting in a little as in we're saying are we letting a good founder go because we are being slow we are a second close is still pending we're going to miss this founder so there's a little bit of that worry but historically we were very accommodative if the guy if a founder came and said hey we really liked you but there's a lead investor he's only giving you 250k we say we'll take it so we're for more we used to adjust that adjust didn't work <laughs> because you get badly treated in the next round you don't get your super pro rata etc and you don't have much ownership and then you're saying i don't treat this founder differently because i have 250k in one and 500 in the other or i have 5% in one and i have 10% in the other and then you realize you're working like a dog for very little ownership and so as a team we decided now we have to put a stop to this so our ownership limits have increased now and since they have increased you just need to come in earlier and more emphatically so if you miss like you rightly said if you miss being the lead and not able to structure the round then you get suboptimal and that's a worry that said in the first 9 months of this fund because we didn't have money for the first 4 5 9 months we've been evaluating pipeline almost 11 months now uh and for the first 4 5 we didn't have the first close done so we had to let go of a few it's okay i think i think philosophically we've taken a view that you have to do 8 9 10 checks a year what how worried can you be of missing one if you think the 8 9 10 are great right you can always say no there'll be 15 great but you can't do 15 a year you can only do 8 9 10 and it's so difficult at seed to say hey the one i missed will be a unicorn so difficult anybody who tells you that is bullshitting i would like to you know now come to the founder part yeah. right since you have stressed on the that quality so much yeah What have you observed in those founders who grew fifty to hundred x since you invested, and those who couldn't grow after your investment? Hmm. So I think there are there are a bunch of you know in my opinion there are a bunch of reasons. I don't think it's about um, um, 
only I, w- I wish you can blame it all on the founder but i think the various things right there's uh, market conditions so the crowd space gets super crowded and then the number of check writers disappear uh, there is uh, niche markets which we are guilty of funding in the first uh, fund nobody seems to care about it after us <laughs> so then you a 2 3x if you don't sell the business you either become a lifestyle business or you'll die so you might as well exit at 2 3x right uh, so niche markets don't work very well uh, and founders should have known better we should have known better uh, so we drive away founders to think bigger now if they come back with too small a vision um, and uh, finally it's, it's fatigue i would argue uh, where you know 3 uh, years pass 4 years pass there's not fatigue just at the founder level it's across the organization you're saying hey it's not like i'm getting 30% pay hikes here right and we've been doing this for 4 years and growing organically nobody's cut a single check after the last round so i i'd rather just exit and move on my opportunity cost is too high and in a sense i think the venture industry is got acclimatized to that behavior they're saying hey if the opportunity cost is too high close it or sell it or move on and build something bigger quickly iterate it's okay all of us are willing to take that hit the folks who get all of these elements right are then on the track to that 50 to 100x but i feel it takes a mad persistence to want to keep learning so when you ask me founder qualities so incredible insatiable energy to build something transformative and transform themselves to get there right they're willing to punish themselves as founders to keep learning keep withstanding all the pressure being the pillar of that you know pressure absorption for the whole firm and make really tough decisions right i mean cut cost cut people you know survive at any cost and there'll always be those phases in all of these founders lives and those are the guys i think or girls who basically break out from this rut and end up building the 5000x right uh, any of those qualities are missing even by a small fraction and then you're in trouble in my opinion things can go bad very quickly in this business i've seen founders riding high and the next year they're gone just gone and things can turn very quickly against you and it's you have you have debt or you have lack of capital or you've overhired and not thought through these things it can go bust very quickly so i, I that tenacity that planning ability to sell a vision ability to keep a team together all those matter so who are the three to four founders in your fund you know who you ideally advise for who you go to no i would i would say uh, right off the bat today morning it's difficult to i mean we've always have this internal joke it's difficult to choose between your children uh, in that sense uh, in value terms i can tell you the guys who are off the gate in terms of having created most paper value taxi for sure of course was along with axel and helen but they were great founders but they've now been exited for years and currently in the portfolio it's gray orange an academy servify uh, turtle mint definitely a little ahead of the pack but right behind them you have danzo milk basket healthify locus nothing i mean this is all marginal differences some of them are at, you know 50 to 100 million range some are 100 to 150 range difficult to choose they're not yet 50 to 100x they're not yet like tomorrow morning i can exit any of them or they can exit themselves but i think if you ask me trajectory wise all of them are capable of building a billion dollar business you have as a fund shied away from secondary exits i would say why have been philosophically i don't believe in it so until a company kind of reaches a billion dollars in valuation and then i've lost track of why the hell they're raising more money or why they mindlessly raising more money i've not yet been in that luxurious position to be honest the only time those decisions have been imposed on me is because i've held ola or zomato stock or true caller stock as a by virtue of them acquiring my company so i have no visibility into them so we did sell our ola stock so it's not like we've never done that's the only case we've done it one case <laughs> and and when the companies break into that unicorn territory i feel like i lose visibility i meaning i'm speaking for the firm we lose visibility on uh where or why these companies are raising money how they're executing the business if miraculously i continue to be on the board i still don't think i'll sell unless i believe that it doesn't meet my threshold of 30% irr let's say right because that's what i've kind of trying to promise my 
hot uh, my lps want me to be the hottest vc right then if it follows below that th- falls below that threshold why am i still invested but if i think it can maintain that threshold why should i sell right and so i'm a believer that if the founder is the ultimate insider and i'm the next best insider i'm the next i'm the guy who cut the first check most of the time so if i don't have that faith how do i expect somebody else to have that faith and cut a new check so if i'm somebody's coming into a new round and you're exiting what are you saying basically structural stuff aside so you might ask hey there's an exit horizon all we have not reached that thankfully you know we still have two more years on our first fund so i have the luxury of having all of that not be a hindrance so far of course after that you have to you know calculate these structural things and say hey my fund is coming to a end of life i have to sell some so we're reaching that point we might do it in a few cases but i'm i'm in as long as the founder is in and thinks they're generating wealth for themselves at 30% irr i'm there with them that's my philosophy yeah that's that's a view i have seen in very few vcs that hold on you know especially from the early stage till the last point to the founder is there in the firm trying to see how long we can hold on to this philosophy without of course there will be lp pressures there will be investor pressures i'm sure at some point we'll tweak it a bit we will get some cash out we will take some out but yes i am uh, to <laughs> to the opposition of some of my lps and and to the uh, you know some of my vc friends are appalled that we take this stance but yeah we've been very hard on this stance so far let's see how it plays out in the next 5 years or so let's talk about more exits so taxi for show to ola from tech to havel zip dial to twitter what were the size of exits for you and were they preempted or they happened by accident so we should add minjer to nutanix and uh, metal to mercer just to give them due credit uh, because they were as big or bigger from tech was small threads all we would have liked it to be bigger but it was little small so it got sold to courts recently so these would be our seven or so big exits of course runner getting to zomato also a decent exit uh, chiller going to true caller decent exit basically there are three sets of exits the ones where we got stock are basically cash guzzling fighting businesses chiller runner taxi for sure so it becomes a battle of cash who can generate more who can create higher valuation let's consolidate let's buy an adjacency because the core business is struggling to make a differentiated pitch in the market i thought chiller was a fantastic play but like nobody other than seco and us believed that so we ended up selling the business things like that the others were all very promising businesses to a global buyer who either wanted india or emerging market access or wanted access to the product portfolio to take global and thought this little indian company out of a bloom portfolio was best in class right and paid anywhere between in most of those cases uh high 30s to high 40s in dollar valuation in fact all four of them were in that range all the b2b exits promptic was a tiny exit never took we were the only guys who gave follow on checks nobody believed that that business was worth funding we gave three checks and sold it to havels for like 10 million dollars it was a public announcement so that number is because they're a public company it's public uh in the first fund all of these were very meaningful because anything which gave us 10 20 crores is 10 20 percent of our fund there's a 100 crore fund if you take that same exit and put it into fund 2 60 million dollar fund relatively meaningless so think about it as a rule of thumb that if things are not generating even 10 20% of your fund value they're not great they're okay i mean full credit to the founder for having tried they gave us money they gave us a multiple of money still doesn't move the needle and then when you are picking you're shooting for things which de- deliver 30 40 50 60 100 percent of your fund super tough you need five or six of those so we still haven't seen that gray orange is marked up there but i haven't ex- exited from there so amongst the hits we've had metal has actually surprisingly delivered the most dollars as much as taxi for sure because though the size was much smaller my stake was much larger so fund one is a very funny fund we had 3% in one and 10% in the other so one could be three times the size but i made the same money right and so that's the blend in fund one but yeah the rule of thumb is that if these things start generating 15 20% of your fund back then they're good good exits we have fund 2 is too early we haven't we've gotten a lot of quick exits in fund 2 but it's usually 1 to 2x uh runner uh true as it's a chiller 
we sold Zenetix to Hero Electronics, we sold uh, Minja to Nutanix, which is the best exit, and we got some cash back as well. But broadly in that range. So I don't, I, I, everybody knows this in the market, I guess, but some of your entrepreneurs might not know. The early exits are never that phenomenal. <laughs> They're okay. Because same argument, it's like exiting early. You can never make a great outcome of 50x by exiting early in a secondary. So similarly, if a company came and bought someone over, but it was before its time, it's not the best possible exit. I would have loved to see, you know, metal go to 100, 200 million. I would love to see Promptech go to 500 crores. And surprisingly, they will get there, but not under my ownership. So to your question, yes, we were. When a strategic comes and buys, in India, not too many people are saying, hey, old trusted investor, you can also stay on for the party. They're saying, you get out. I'll figure it out with the founders. <laughs> right? So they clean out the cap table. You take what you get and move on. Don't stress about it. You know that even by sticking around, it's not likely to be your top five, top six. Flipkart is a freak outcome where they're continuing to stay and they're still riding the upside. That's very rare. What challenges or hardships you have faced, which most of us don't know about? I think um, I still don't think too many people appreciate how difficult it is for our side to raise capital, right? Uh, and it's incredibly tough. Uh, as much as I have to do it for a living, I'm not fond of that job. Uh, and it's no different from a founder's struggle. And we ask founders to uh, empathize with our empathizing for them <laughs> by saying, look, we understand your pain. Don't lose heart because we do this for a living all day. And I wish it were easier for us. It's not easier. I'm hoping it'll get easier from Fund 4 because we'll have results. But first three funds were all equally tough. Um, gets better, but it's equally tough. Uh, it's like somebody saying Series B is easier than Series A or C. No, it's tough. And, and that's one, one part. Second, I've realized is uh, how much ever you feel like you're building a cute little 10, 15 person. Now we're up to 16 people. Small organization. I'm, I realize it's not necessarily my core forte. It's like I, that part of entrepreneurship, I probably didn't you know, fully sign up for in my head. I have to grow into it. So it's not hardships, but it's just much tougher than you expect. Because you'd rather just be you know, cutting checks, managing portfolio, you do fundraising, and suddenly you, know, you realize that you're responsible for a, f a team that keeps growing, right? And their futures and their... And you're asking them to like give up a lot, be underpaid, buy into the passion, vision of a bloom, and stick around for 10 years, 20 years, not easy. You're pretty much asking them to be like a life partner of a various kind, of a different kind. Um, and that's, it takes a toll emotionally far more than I've ever imagined. Uh, I think that is, that's super challenging. Um, and this is out of the bloom journey. Um, prior to the bloom journey, I think, you know, not too many people know this, but like I went through a 10 year phase from uh, graduating out of Wharton to starting Bloom, where I ran through six different jobs, right? And uh, it never looked like I exactly knew what I was doing. Uh, but I've just converted it to a strength today because all those networks, all those varied experiences are very, very useful when you're doing venture capital. <laughs> they're not very useful in most other industries, but they're fun to deploy and reuse in venture capital. But it's tough because people used to always not slot you and those years of trying to figure out where you fit were really tough uh, and now yes people skip jobs every few years but I, I didn't intend to do that for someone who likes stability long term think about my current business there's no exit what exit I'm stuck for it for life right so that's my DNA for someone who, who thinks that way in the first 10 years to see six jobs out of business school was uh, a little too much to handle a lot so, of internal struggles, I must yeah, say. It, 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 if you don't, uh, and I think that's what I said, however small the efforts might have been of each of the team members to be entrepreneurs, if you've not gone through that, it's very difficult to empathize, right? It's very difficult to know uh, how tough this is to, it's, you know, to be able to be in their shoes. And for us, our uh, USP is to pick early. So it's a given. However much of a rock star you might have thought you were in some org or in some other startup, these are non-trivial. And you might come with a little bit more, you know, bravado, but the challenges continue to exist. Unless you're like a true serial entrepreneur who's built to 
let's say in the zero to 10 journey, I put that benchmark at four, five or six. If you cross that, then you've gone through a lot of this. And you say second time, this is easy. But if you're a first time and you've, you've never built anything beyond three or four, then all these challenges are there. And having gone through this, you can relate to them in founders far more. So I don't think any journey of entrepreneurial journey is easy. It might look like it's cool to be on the VC side. It's as much of a struggle. I still don't have, I've not seen a rupee of carry. Uh, I've not had extra savings for like eight years. That's all fine. That's all financial. That's like, again, equivalent to my founders. I think by now, almost every Series B founder in my portfolio earns more than me, <laughs> which is a good sign. And uh, are now the founders like Taxi for sure are LPs in bloom. That's a great it's kind sign. of almost a mandated KRA. Uh, I mean, the first founders will obviously be betrothed to Sanjay or me mostly. But uh, the KRA is that if you can't get your exited founders back as LPs, then we've screwed up somewhere. So uh, we, we try to push because we have an Indian fund structure. It's easier for us. But yeah, we'd like to believe that they like the journey enough that uh, exit or no, uh, the minute you exit, you can't exit out of our lives. I take a crore back and then you're stuck for 10 more. Because I'm not giving you the exit from the fund. So you're stuck with me as a Bloom LP for another 10 years. So it's more a signaling, I think it's more an emotional thing that we don't want each side to sort of forget as we diverge in lives. And, and if they truly enjoyed the journey, I want them to be a part of the Bloom journey, be mentors, be advisors, be supporters, be co-investors. So we used to have a slide in uh, uh, in our deck in fund two. Most LPs didn't understand it, so I removed it. We used to call it LTV of a founder, long-term value of a founder to the firm. And uh, I think philosophically, that's how we're structured. So we say that after the founder, like think about it, right? Some of our fa failed fund one founders by, by value given back to me, head of Quora, head of YouTube, head of Hotstar, Hotstar for International, they're all our guys who didn't give me any money. So these are all good guys. We pick good people, right? Why would you want to break links with them? So if the guys made enough money, I'm saying definitely you have to come back as an LP. So that's, that's firm policy now. And what I've heard is that Bloom is the only fund that loves its children who have succeeded as much as children who have failed. No, I think it's not about love as much as respect, I would say. I think we respect uh, founder journeys irrespective of where they land up. Uh, unless founders have, uh, you know, I don't think anyone's blatantly trans, you know, has had blatant transgressions on that journey. I think some people we don't, we say, hey, you gave up too easily, right? What is that about? How did we misread you so much? I'm not saying that feeling is not there. With a few founders, it is there. They vanished on us after the death, right? And there are some who have come back, they've taken another check, they've skipped a fund and taken a check. They're in all of these corporate roles and they interact with us. They come for our bloom days. All great. And so I think it's more of that. I don't think it's about giving them a place in the sun which I can give to, you know, a Raghu or a Ketan or a, you know, I can't do that. That's not fair, right? These are the guys who made us uh, the brand that we are. So they'll definitely get a little bit bombave, no doubt. But we respect who those founders are and we try to say, hey, we value who you will become. It's not the end of life, right? It's the end of one small journey. After that, there's another 20 years of life together. You'll be in the ecosystem, I'm in the ecosystem. We're going to end up working with one another irrespective. Unless you were, you were miserable at what you did or you just failed at what you did, it's going to come back in some. So this paid forward attitude, somewhere in the, I always have it now recorded in my vision, purpose, equal. It's almost a given or a DNA in the firm. So we try to instill it even inside of founders. We actually are, sometimes get pissed off with the founders who don't use our or pay it forward enough inside of our f portfolio. We say, boss, why aren't you working with the portfolio company? Why aren't you giving them more time? Things like that. And so I think we try to instill it in everybody we touch. And so that's more of the f mentality rather than just founder love for the sake of. What points in life were you lost and what helped you recover from it? I, I, basically, I, in, the biggest complaint most people have with me is I'm just too even keeled. I, I don't think I'll appear lost at any point, right? So <laughs> I'm, I'm fairly composed most of the time. Um, 
and uh, lost in the sense that it felt like directionless uh, which is a little different though it's a you can argue argue that it's a synonym i think uh, 2004 5 sitting in the us you know no visibility into whether this green card will come and i'm itching to do something new i'm in a corporate job it was a reuters subsidiary and that itch eventually transformed itself it took some time i actually used to sit on week weekends and uh, try to do a startup uh, which looked like youtube for international content back then even before youtube was launched around 3 4 it was born out of the idea that there were uh, world cup uh, cricket used to be watched internationally only through velo tv and not online so that was a, that was the idea uh, and uh, and there was this frustration that you couldn't be the entrepreneur you couldn't get out of the job uh, you needed to support yourself there's still student loans to pay uh, thankfully we didn't have children but basically you're going through a cycle and saying where the hell is this going and 2005 when i came back for a winter break was the first time i actually went and said i think it might be time to come back to india and this is not like some midlife crisis i was still early 30s it's not the end of the world but i think in my head i felt like restless that i needed to make some drastic shift so by 2006 march i was here uh, instant got sold to nasdaq came a natural hey this is your signal now act on it and so i quit the job had a backup job somewhere near baltimore uh, came here uh, spent three or four months out of six months felt like quite uh uh directionless again in terms of what jobs were being offered to me i took the plunge and then of course been here 13 years now so for all that is forgotten the only thing i remember and i can look forward to is bloom so bloom is considered today among the top 3 early stage vcs in india what are the your habits that have made or contributed towards the success of bloom i don't know how to classify um it's a habits per se but i would say i mean nothing works like hard work so incredible perseverance and persistence it's almost like the days where the wife will ask uh, how was your day or how was your week and you would just look back and say thankfully enough good news to tide over the bad news <laughs> right and your industry is that way your job is that way you're de- dealing with early stage risk every day um and uh, so i think to keep your composure try to take away the positives from every day uh and build that into a habit and not let it affect your next meeting literally like meeting to meeting you have to switch personas right uh and so it's not like i, I do deep meditation or anything but i think i'm just very uh, composed and very objective very fair and then uh, double it, double down that with a dose of incredible persistence and hard work and uh, that's what we try to drive within the firm and say look what we've signed up for is not trivial i mean to make a 100 crore fund out of 2011 or a 400 crore or fund out of 2015 a five bagger is not trivial right uh, we don't have deep pockets we are not the guys who can back unicorns off the bat and you still have to make 5x uh, sound super tough so be prepared for a incredibly long grind it may or may not play out but we should be proud of the journey so i think it's it's these two things predominantly the other thing which i've baked into and i try to instill some of it but that's a dna thing i don't think everybody is capable of doing it is incredibly efficient i mean i almost tell uh, friends family that sort of proudly but almost i should be ashamed that literally manufacture time right so you you pull out I'm a multitasker by nature but i pull out time from all sorts of corners of the day so it's almost like i create 25 hours out of 24 and that i think is a dna thing i don't think it's a habit you can form you need to be wired that way so uh, yeah my plane rides are meetings my yeah the last two plane rides i've taken are meetings inside the plane so yeah, you just you just do it uh, not because it's you know it's cool to do it just yeah because you can get more done and that's how i've worked 8 years uh, 100 125 flights a year Eight years, a thousand flights since Bloom started. You just make it work. And from a founder's perspective, from the outside, the job of the VC seems to be easy. No, I think it's uh, it, <laughs> as simple as it may sound. We are a derivative of the founder's success, right? So if collectively our founders have screwed up, we look like a crappy firm. If they have worked, we look like a good firm. So to be able to say that our job is any easier actually think about it 
the good founders coast relatively speaking they get great partners they'll have like excel sequoia nexus and multiple cool names to hang uh, to deal with them they have more money they can hire the talent if you think about it the guys who need you the most are the ones who are lagging behind for whatever reason right either they're selling a tough sell or they're not able to raise money so how's you're not actually even the mean or the average of all of these you're actually skewed towards taking on more of the troubles of the laggard founders right and so your job is not the mean of return like returns are the mean of all performance your effort and your slog is not the mean of all performance it's skewed towards the tougher journeys the tougher stories because that's why you're actually pulled in more and our dna is to help irrespective so we get pulled in more so yeah far from sexy i think it's it's a journey we enjoy we we're slightly removed the founder has their own challenges which to a founder will look like 100x tougher than ours uh we have variants of it our teams are small so we don't have to deal with as many people issues as many ops issues etc but then if you're if you're the empathetic kind then you tend to absorb a lot of that as mm-hmm. as if they were your own problems so the sum total adds up to a lot especially when you sit with 120 companies over 8 years <laughs> so towards the conclusion of the podcast what were the noise on those signals which you missed investing in oyo swiggy i know these guys pitched to you early on in their journey as early stage you know uh, as really early stage investors first check investors um, i can make up 10 excuses on why i passed or missed on them so the 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 summary point though is that it's a lot of it is circumstances a lot of it is circumstances um in the case of oyo we had something remotely competing when uh, ritesh met us first as oravel uh, even before the teal fellowship he was saying i do like an airbnb for india right and he said yeah but we have like a vacation rental place in our portfolio how different is this bright kid but and that's it after that we i mean we again met him in the valley when he was a teal fellow but uh we just said i don't know whether there's enough for us to jump into it that's it and that's it you missed that window and he's gone right he is raised an equivalent amount from somebody else it doesn't make sense to dilute that person right uh same thing with bavish he raised two rounds you can't go and say i want the same valuation same round right and uh we thankfully we got into at least taxi for sure but we love the space but we ended up you know uh, playing at least one company but we didn't end up playing the other so no stress around that similarly with swiggy when uh, i can't remember which two founders i met on the rooftop of ub but uh, they were selling more of a courier aggregator it's called bundle which is the original name of the company which is still used today and i said no i don't think we'll do something like this and then uh, obviously they must have met anand that axel who liked them cut a million dollars i can't even compete with a million dollars back then we used to be 250k 500k check writers so it's gone and then you don't think too much about hey you missed it somehow i'll win it back because i don't have more money to win it back in the next round and so i feel the signal is difficult to glean when there is a slight mismatch in thesis geography speed there have been cases where the we tell the founder hey nice meeting you keep us posted next thing you hear about it is four months later they've raised a million dollars from somebody else they must have said hey yaar bloom wale acche hain but they can't cut more than 250k i'm talking about fund 1 lot of these are fund 1ish misses you have to put that in context as well right uh, back then we used to cut 150 200 250k checks anybody wanted more than that we were second choice now we'll have to now also we'll end up missing some but i think now i wouldn't be dejected at all at missing because you are actually shifted the firm's dna to think about why you play what you play not why you miss what you miss and that's the, that's the dna of bloom today right and so i can't sit in lament over what i missed unless unless you liked the thesis area you would have liked this founder and you did not create a pipeline mechanism to draw that founder to pitch to you then there's a problem everything else is no problem everything else is no problem the other uh, and the other reason we've empowered the rest of the team is because i can't sit and meet everybody right so you can't create an environment where there'll be false negatives false positives take care those are your failures in a portfolio <laughs> false negatives uh, where you know i say that hey uh, 
person X in my team passed on something they shouldn't have passed, I wouldn't have passed on it, is a bad excuse. You can't meet every founder. So what if we created a culture of anybody in the six, first not doing or looking at things which they don't understand. So we are sectorally super focused now, super tight. So why the hell are you looking at anything in life sciences, boss? You can't judge a founder. You don't have a bloody view on the space, right? So you pass it on to your colleague. So then we are making sure that the colleague sees this at first look. And the right person in the team looks at it. And arguably, for whatever it's worth, I trust their judgment to make a better judgment on this than we, than we ever will, than I might have. That's fine. I have to trust that the founder, that my Arpit or Sajit or Sanjay looked at 20 companies in the space and made the one bet they wanted to. I'm going to lament that they one of the other 19 got missed. So that's how the partnership grows, I think. And that's probably what every firm goes through. So it, signal versus noise can be differentiated when you define your signal very well. Otherwise, everything is noise, boss. Otherwise, you're making a herd bet again. You're going by the flow of the market. That you'll read a signal. That's also noise, if you ask me. So if you don't define your own signal, everything is, everything is going to look like noise. Well said, Karthik. The last question for the podcast. What three advices would you like to share with young founders to deliver excellence in business? Probably going to blog about this, so I'll write more in detail in the next, uh, hopefully in the next week or two, if not in the next month. I'm, I'm tired of anything but IPO-like thinking, right? You can't build a business worthy of an IPO, don't build boss, right? And so I'm of the view that all these like tiny hacks and building some cute product and like some funky game or so I, I'm tired, right? I'm not interested anymore. So from my perspective, and, and the founders are entitled to go build a business, sell it for $30 million and make a lot of money, right? It's not for me. So, and the advice therefore that's coming out of it, whether the founders want to take it or not, is that I think I have begun to realize that you get one shot at grand glory, right? There are very, very few founders who come and build three unicorn businesses right or four you recall so when you start you don't start with the intent of saying nah, ye innings mein thoda, you know pad up karke idhar udhar chauka marunga hit ho gaya hai. otherwise we'll figure it out yeah next innings i'll play for a century i don't want to be advising or inter- be investing in such founders you come to the crease you say i want to bat you play for the century right which to in my mind is an ipo right don't tell me you're building a business on the promise of something elaborate which can never go IPO. And what does IPO basically mean? It's a sustainable business. After 10 years, the world at large shouldn't care whether you're still at the helm, right? The business should be scalable and run. The minute you build that, there'll be 20 buyers in private and 1,000 buyers in public for a business like that. I'm convinced that that is the way to exit. So I'm saying, why are we lamenting that we haven't built exits when you're not designing businesses in that fashion? So if you're not building IPO ready businesses and not thinking super long term, don't get started. That's point A, I would say. Second is, I'm, you know, the st- storyteller in chief, the visionary in chief, the founder in chief is the CEO. Founder CEOs, we love founder CEOs. They should stay at the helm for as long as required. If you can stay at the helm for 20 years, even better, like Jeff Bezos. But to underestimate how important your ability to build great teams is, is basically you're putting your foot in your mouth, right? So you're not going to build a great business. I'm convinced of that. And therefore, going back to your storytelling feature, forget about everybody else. Can you storytell to hire a great team? Will the team stick around with you, not maybe a decade at a time, but four or five years at a time? Do you have your co-founders who will stick with you? How many, I think 75% of our companies have lost at least a minor co-founder by the Series B? series A. It's like, what the hell's going on? Didn't you guys sell the story well to each other? Right? And so if that's the passion with which you're hiring team, then you're doing convenient team building. Yes, you can make mistakes. I'm not saying it should be flawless. But if you don't think you can empower a great team, I don't think you can build a great business. So I would say team, team, team. Uh, My anecdote for this is the era of, uh, you know, Superman is over. It's an era of superheroes. So nowadays, if you pick up uh, any superhero movie, one person never wins a war. You need a whole whole battalion of them. Uh, and my other favorite, you know, it's a flip on, it, it might sound uh, like a wordplay, but I, I don't like founders who come and uh, 
uh, especially in early stage because that's who we're talking about who come and pitch the coolest solutions solutions mean jack in the first one two year right i have between pitch saying yes term sheet and first board meeting the damn product changes half the time so what are we talking about right i don't care what you sold me as a product what are you solving for is it fundamentally shape shifting for the industry for the planet for the customer and are you cognizant of how large an impact you can make on that front so if you can't focus on the problem don't come and build some cool solution for it cool solutions exist all the time right if cool solutions were to make it then we wouldn't have a million apps right so we every one of them should be a billion dollar company they're not so it's the equivalent of somebody coming and saying hey i built a cool app for this i built a cool hack for this but what problem are you solving and i would advise founders to wrap their heads around that because they're all interlinked if you don't have a passionate enough problem to solve you can't be committed to it for a decade it can't be built into an ipo business and you will not have a team which will ride the journey with you so why bother so that's that, those are my three points of advice thank you so much karthik we love your straight forwardness and wish many more ipos to bloom thank you thanks a lot